Good evening, good afternoon, good night, and good morning. Thank you for tuning in to RETV News Break. I'm Tyron. And Nicole with your weekly RETV News Break. Every week, Ty and I bring you news, trends, and more with a positive spin. For our first story, about 70 Alabama colleges have received nearly $800 million in federal funding through the American Rescue Plan, U.S. Rep. Terry Swell said on the eve of the one-year anniversary of the ARP COVID-19 relief package. At least half the funds are being used to provide direct financial relief to students, Swell said. And I quote, as the only member of the Alabama delegation to vote in favor of the American Rescue Plan, I was proud to help secure urgently needed funding to strengthen Alabama schools and support college students in our state. Swell said, the success of our colleges, universities, and students is critical to the success to the success of state of Alabama. And one year after President Biden and the Democratic Congress enacted the American Rescue Plan, Alabama's campuses are seeing the results. Thanks to this landmark law, Alabama's colleges, universities have the resources to continue serving students and bring down costs despite unprecedented, unprecedented health and learning challenges. As we emerge from this pandemic, I will continue fighting to build a better Alabama, especially for our students. Distributed by the U.S. Department of Education's Higher Education Emergency Relief Fund, the American Rescue Plan delivered one of the largest one-time infusions of funding ever provided to America's colleges and universities, Swell said. In Alabama, more than $300 million went to community colleges, more than $334 million went to 13 historically black colleges and universities, more than $34 million went to four minority serving institutions, which include predominantly black and Hispanic serving institutions. So I was proud to see that, you know, 13 HBCUs have received, you know, a good chunk of that budget like you know i think they said 34 million mm -hmm. i actually had to sit there and look up because i wasn't i knew there were a few um hbcus in alabama but wasn't exactly sure um how many of them were i knew mm -hmm. of alabama and a and m alabama state um but couldn't really think of any other ones so i had to look very closely i know there's uh bishop state bishop state community college mm -hmm. uh concordia college in alabama gaston state community college h council uh, there's a bunch of them um drake community so there's I, I didn't realize that there were as many community colleges um that are considered hbcus specifically i guess in alabama than there were um than there are um, i really did not know that so that's really a great thing that they're able to get uh, a good chunk of this money to be able to propel them forward and of the hbcus alabama a and m university received 60 million alone mm. so i, I and, and while i applaud that going to Alabama A&M, they are one of the more well-known HBCUs. Oh, they are. Um, okay. But I definitely think, you know, we should be, or not we, but, you know, a lot of money should be given to some of the smaller ones so that way they too. Because we tend to forget about a lot of the, the smaller HBCUs. Yeah. Um, we usually focus on the big ones like Howard and Grambling and FAMU and um, a few other ones that, you know, that are more widely known or more or more talked about, shall I say. Okay. Um, and Alabama A&M and Alabama State are you know some more they're not at the top of the list top of the list per se um of course the people who went there they are <laughs> but they're not at the top of the list but for those again because i didn't even know there were a bunch of community colleges that were considered hbcus you know it'd be Neither great to I. see great to see the, you know them get that money and, and grow as well and to that point they have like shelton state community college all of these are based in alabama they receive 29 million um h council trenholm state community college 21 million Gadsden State Community College, 18 million. Miles College, 18 million. Talladega College, 18 million. Um, and JF Drake State Community and Technical College, about 11 and a half million. Wow, I mean, don't get me wrong. Regardless, it's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But you know, I know um, Alabama A and M, Alabama State probably you know got the the, the majority or the chunk of the money. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. You know, regardless, I'm pretty sure they're going to put that money to good use. So that's a uh, great for them. Definitely. In our next story, Daryl Lilly and his family, the owners of Seafood Kings 2 on City Island in Bronx, New York, making its first black-owned restaurant in the area. 
Daryl, who has been in the restaurant industry for 20 years, established the first Seafood Kings restaurant in September of 2019. I hate when I see 20 before a word because I'm like 22 <laughs> to year. Yeah, exactly. 2019 <laughs> on Linden Boulevard in Queens. I'm actually very familiar with Linden Boulevard. I'm going to have to go check them out um, next time I'm in, in Queens. Okay. Even during the pandemic, the business has been doing great enough for him to decide to open another location wow. in South Bronx, which was eventually closed due to complications in expansion. Fortunately, a new opportunity came in City Island where they coincidentally found that the location they wanted to occupy five years ago was now for rent. Daryl says he immediately took advantage of the opportunity to open his franchise's second restaurant with his whole family joining as well. We give them an avenue to have some of their own food with the things that they love. So you get your seafood with the soul food trimmings. You can't copy it up here. You know, you can't imitate it. This is the real stuff, real soul food stuff, Daryl told the Bronx Times. Lily's 21-year-old son, Dalvin, who serves as the restaurant's head chef, was the one who developed the menu, which features a variety of seafood options such as king crab legs, fried lobster tails, fish, shrimp, and a lot more. Now hmm. I'm hungry. I was about to say, I know it's lunchtime, it's about that 12 o'clock hour, but I that just seafood. made me a little hungry. Yeah, especially seafood and soul food. That's a heck of a com I would say that's a heck of a combination. So you can probably I, I haven't seen the menu, so I don't quote me, mm -hmm. but you can probably get your seafood with a little bit of mac and cheese and collard greens and some candy yams and uh, I don't know whatever with all we all considered you know soul food. food. Yeah, yeah. So that definitely is a um, congratulations uh, to you and your family. Again, I didn't even know about the first location. I don't, we, you know we're not based in in New York. Um, but we do actually have family in New York, especially in the Queens area, um, literally right on Linden Boulevard. Um, so we'll definitely have to check them out next time we're up in the uh, Queens, New York area. I, actually, we have family yeah, that's up there that we can go. Yeah, with the family and yeah. tell them to check them so out. So make sure well. for our family who's watching, our friends who's mm -hmm. watching in the New York area, y'all make sure y'all go check them out um, in, in their first and their second locations. Wow. Awesome. For our next story, in honor of Women's History Month, Shalonda Young on Tuesday became the first black woman to lead the White House Budget Office after the Senate confirmed her to the cabinet level position with bipartisan support. The vote was 61 to 36. Young has served as acting director of the Office of Management and Budget, better known as OMB, for the past year. She was confirmed last March by the Senate to serve as the duty director and ascended to the top role after Neri Tandon's nomination was withdrawn because Tandon didn't have enough support in the Senate. Nearly nine months after Tandon's nomination was withdrawn, Biden officially nominated Young as director. Quote, another glass ceiling shattered by a remarkable member of the president's historic cabinet, end quote, stated by Senator Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said of the young of young in a speech on the Senate floor on Monday ahead of the vote. Schumer said it shouldn't have taken this long to confirm someone as obviously as qualified as Shalanda Young. She's been leading the OMB for nearly a year. She knows the budget and appropriations processes like the back of her hand. She's proven capable of working with Republicans and Democrats alike. And it was through her guidance that the administration notched some of its biggest victories, including the passage of the bipartisan infrastructure law, end quote. When Tandon's nomination fell through last year, many Democrats on Capitol Hill pushed for Young to get the top job. The Congressional Black Caucus rallied behind Young for the job in the Biden administration, as did House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and her entire House Democratic leadership team. Young was the first black woman to serve as a staff director of the House Appropriations Committee and won bipartisan praise for her work in that role. She worked on the committee for more than 14 years and took over as staff director in 2017. The key office, which oversees all budget development and execution and has significant influence over the president's agenda, has been without a Senate-confirmed leader since the president took office last January. It was the last cabinet-level position that remained unfilled. Some experts criticized the delay in naming an official director and argued that while acting directors can still perform the full range of 
official duties, they lack the full weight of the permanent title. In addition to budget development and execution, OMB reviews an array of policies and rules throughout the federal government. That's pretty cool. Congratulations, dope. Miss Yolanda. Not only do you have the title, but now you also have the income that goes along with it that <laughs> should not have taken more than nine months to get there, in my opinion. <laughs> yes, yeah, your opinion is correct. That it should not have taken that long in order for for her to get it. But what I'm definitely proud of, more so than anything else, this is a conversation that I've I've seen on a few other shows here on RETV, is that she got appointed because of her qualifications mm -hmm. not specifically because she's, she's a black female exactly, exactly. And which I, should be the case for any job that anyone gets it shouldn't be a quid pro quo but unfortunately that's what it has been it's been because you know hey we want to put you know the first black or the first you know female or the first hispanic or the first whatever in in offices or in positions you know of leadership um, and it hasn't been that way because so many have been against it. So many have been against women. You know, I know this is specifically a, a story dealing with Women's History Month. So many have been against, you know, the advancement of women. So they say, oh, when well, they see, you know, a woman on the ballot or see a woman, you know, who's next up qualified, they overlook her regardless of, you know, whether she's black, white, Hispanic or anything else. And then go move on to the next, you know, the, the, the guys who are, who are next in line. Mm -hmm. um, and that should not be the case. Yeah. You know, if there is a woman who is qualified or over or well qualified, like I said, she knows this role like the back of her hand, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, she should have been in that position well before, you know, last Monday when Biden, you know, uh, when she was, you know, appointed. Uh, that That's just my personal opinion. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I'm very proud that she's, you know, in this position. And again, kudos to you. Um, it's been well overdue. Well overdue. And to think this person in this position, they're over the budget. Mm. So they have a lot of clout and a lot of influence on the president and his team when it comes to deciding what gets funded and what doesn't get funded. Mm -hmm. So it'd be interesting to see what comes down the pipe, um, especially in our more um, desolate areas that need funding, i.e. Detroit, Michigan. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm really, really glad to see that not only is she a black female, but she's definitely qualified for mm -hmm. the position. Exactly. In our final story, it's no question that the impact that historically black colleges and universities, better known as HBCUs, have had on our, not only on our culture, but mainstream culture as a whole. Today, that rang true as Ralph Lauren's partnership with Morehouse College and Spelman College expanded to new heights, rolling out a limited edition collection inspired by the rich history of the schools. The first of its kind collaboration is reminiscent of old days on the esteemed campuses. The robust collection includes outerwear, knits, tailored suits, dresses, footwear, accessories, and more, and are direct references to the posh and poised styles worn by Morehouse and Spelman students from the 20s to the 50s. Quote, this collection expresses the spirit of history, deep sense of community, and legacy of timeless dressing at historically black colleges and universities, says Ralph Lauren, executive chairman and chief creative officer of Ralph Lauren Corporation in a press release. I quote, it's so much more than the portrayal of a collegiate design sensibility. It's about sharing a more complete and authentic portrait of American style of, a, of the American dream, ensuring stories of black life and experiences are embedded in the inspiration and aspiration of our brand, end quote. The collection is one of that one of a continued partnership with the retailer and the colleges. In 2020, Ralph Lauren's corporate foundation pledged $2 million to support scholarships for students at Morehouse College, Spelman College, and 10 HBCUs through the United Negro College Fund. Furthermore, Ralph Lauren is charting new paths for black talent of Morehouse and Spelman through internships, recruitment, mentorships, and development program. I quote, Spelman's, Spelman's college culture is a powerful combination of both community and engagement and confident self-invention. -in this collection celebrates the inventiveness and individual styles when it intersects boldly with institutional tradition, such as choices on display in wearing a white attire. 
says Mary Schmidt Campbell, PhD, president of Spelman College. By sharing the early history of Spelman as reflected in archival research through clothing, the collection encourages conversations about the creative power of the black experience and the ways in which a personal fashion aesthetic intersects with institutional values of solidarity and connection. Nice. I think it's I dope. I've heard about this before. I think it's pretty dope. I do have a little thing about it though. However, <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong, everybody has their styles. Uh -huh. um, I had an opportunity, and we'll actually put up some pictures of, of, what it, of, of some of the designs and, mm -hmm. and, and so forth. Um, it is styles of the 20s and 50s, and I know they say everything kind of, you know, circles it's back nice. around, and mm -hmm. it's just not my style. I really? mean, yeah, don't get me wrong. Obviously, I, 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 well, I say obviously, but I've never, I obviously have not gone to Spelman, it's all female school, right. um, and have not you know, had, um, uh, attended Morehouse, all male black um, HBCU. Um, and I know in Morehouse specifically, they do encourage the men to, you know, dress very professional in suits and so forth, okay. um, especially during certain programs and um, uh, 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 different things that they offer there. Mm -hmm. And I'm a, I believe it's the same there at Spelman. Okay. Um, but when you look at it, it does look of the old fashion, like you mentioned, black and white, long dresses. And they're not more so suits, but they're like sweater vests and blazers and mm. you know things like that. It's I'm different. Look this up it's, it's definitely different. I would be interested to see what these threads, as they used to call them back in the right in that era, um, what they look like. I bet you I like it. You probably will. It is. Like I say it's very different, and I, I will be definitely interested to see what this generation thinks of it mm. because the, you know the generation you know they're into to tight pants and cut off shirts and everything else so to see them go back to the styles and traditions of the 20s and the 50s when you know people were you know I guess initially attending Morehouse and Spelman mm -hmm. and that's how they dressed back then it will just definitely be interesting to see how they how they accept this from Ralph Lauren yeah. and and I'm curious to know as well and I have to do a little bit more research on this and probably uh, report on this on another episode okay. but I, I if I'm not mistaken I didn't think Ralph Lauren was one and I could be confused using them with someone else who really cared for African Americans to wear their stuff in the first place. But I could be wrong. I could be wrong. I'm not sure. So again, I'll definitely have to, I don't want to put that out there and that's something that may not necessarily be the case. But if that is the case, then that is good to see that, that you know, things have potentially changed within the company and organization of Ralph Lauren, um, that they have, you know, expanded their, their mindsets to um, a whole different genre, a whole different generation um, of people, and especially going into HBCUs on the collegiate, you know, the collegiate level. And one would hope, you know, but that seems to be the running trend that a lot of national known you know, majority owned white companies are mm -hmm. trying to um, turn the leaf, if you will. Um, hopefully it is genuine and not just for the almighty black dollar. Exactly. So I definitely, you know, encourage us to continue to shop black because mm -hmm. I know that there are a ton of HBCU wear clothing lines out there. Um, there are a ton of um, African-American, um, both male and female uh designers and in yeah. clothing companies that are out there but also check out the Ralph Lauren line you know the Ralph Lauren collection for Spelman and and uh and Morehouse and who knows if they may even potentially expand that line to other HBCUs as well. And we encourage you guys to hit us up at info at RETV RE dash TV. Thank you. <laughs> info at RE dash TV dot net and let us know what type of stories you would like for us to report on as well. If there's some that are interesting to you, send it the, send us the link and we'll be sure to look them over and um, probably broadcast them here on the network. Exactly. So you can send it to info at RE dash TV dot net or news at RE dash TV dot net as well. And we'll be able to go ahead and review those and uh, potentially get those on there. We thank you for tuning in to, uh, to this week's episode of RETV Newsbreak. Be sure to subscribe to the RETV YouTube channel and Facebook pages for more great news and shows. Don't forget, you can also download the RETV Roku channel by simply going to Roku, going into channels, and typing in RETV, download, and also rate. But we look forward to seeing you next week. Again, same time, same place, right here. Until then, be, be blessed, blessed and, and be, be great. great. Beans. Yeah. Damn, right on top. Look at that. Was... Set that where it doesn't go to sleep. <sighs> yes and no. Um.
Hey, it's your girl, Tia Robertson. I'm the host of Entrepreneur Insider. Eastern for entrepreneurs and news that you need to know about. See you there. Welcome to What's Going On? My name is Demita Joe. Each Wednesday, you can find me here at 3 p.m. I'll be over here discussing different things that are going on and try to bring you a boost of positivity for your week because we all need this. We're going to share some feel-good stories. We might find a hometown hero. We may take a look at some trending topics. And sometimes we might even find a lesson in a not so warm and fuzzy story if we can. I'm Demita Joe, and I'll see you guys on the next episode right here on What's Going On? Growing up in the church, we saw a lot. Things that people refused to talk about. The elephants in the room. Mental illness, sexual abuse, broken family, domestic violence, and so much more. The Big E, The Elephant in the Room is a show that sheds light on these topics. We're here to speak about the unspeakable.